incredibly rich, dense um, series of presentations that I gather are probably are going to continue past this because um, I definitely think it's like, oh, people who speak my language finally, um, which is really wonderful, and also on the same wavelength, which is really extraordinary. Um, so, I mean, I, I just met Paul today, so <laughs> that's why this is just really fortuitous. Um, and so. Um, I think that there are a number of things that um, are clearly intersecting in this. Um, but one of the things I think uh, is really interesting and I kind of want to unpack a little bit more is the question of temporality. Um, and then we're going to maybe go to something spatial and then I want to talk about the collaborative nature um, of, you know, like what might be productive, what sorts of spatial practices might be emerging and understanding both the city but also what blackness actually might produce more broadly. Um, so, um, I think Kelly, you really addressed this wonderfully in terms of the question of temporal lags um, and the, the, um, the uh, kind of really amazing term that, uh, chrono, but also chrono, chrononormativity, right? Um, because I don't think that we realize or we think about it in that way, but it's often, um, I mean, I certainly sort of feel that within institutions like universities that there's a kind of homogeneous temporality and a, and a way of understanding history. Um, that then trickles down into, because it's history with a big age, into ways in which temporalities are you know, literally practiced on a daily basis. And I think this question of, the, the question of understanding chrononormativity and finding other sorts of temporalities, um, which then begin to open up um, other kinds of spaces to, be, to do the productive thinking and imagining, sort of necessary to sort of move beyond some of the, the, the um, you know, some, some, some of the things that sort of imprison, I think, um, uh, people in, in their, their uh, current conditions. And so I, I wanted to pose that. I mean, what is, what, you know, like in what ways can um, this question of temporality um, in the various places that we're looking at, whether it's Johannesburg, but in Lisbon and London, and in um, New York, or in the American South, like how do we begin to understand in what ways, you know, other temporalities have well, one of the, there's a lot of great writing on this, and, um, you know, I was really struck by the, the way that uh, people writing on queer time, they, there's some of the same ideas about Afrofuturism. So this is, um, they're different, um, you know, in that they're interested in queerness, but that there's a lot of thinking about that, and I think there's other uh, <coughs> things that I've just, is it accelerism? People have probably heard about it, where people are thinking about this, and I don't want to say, oh, Afrofuturism was first, but there's a lot of people are thinking about this a lot. Yeah. Uh, a book that is um, not about Afrofuturism, uh, but um, engages that is by one of our uh, great colleagues at Barnard, Keith Moxie, uh, Visual Time, the Image in History. Mm -hmm. And he's also talking about this idea that comes up a lot when you're talking about Afro diasporic populations or you know around the globe, which is that people are lagging behind modernism, right? So he talks about you know we all know why this is, but he's kind of trying to explode that whole idea and say we cannot think about this kind of singular march. In his case, he's talking about modernism even though he also goes back to 17th century. But, um, you know, we have to look about, look at how, you know, different situations and take them differently. So I think that's something, as you've just been talking about, where uh, we have this idea, and part of it, as he mentions, is this link to kind of singular history, which is positive in the West, right? right. The so West runs, history. yeah, universal history is really Western history. Right, <laughs> and so it doesn't take into account other people. And also, what happens is that the ways, and I think this points to Paul and Paul's work, uh, the ways that people have engaged with their lives and changed these supposed, you know, this Western universal solid idea of history or space or whatever is sublimated, right, and absorbed and uh, assimilated. So it doesn't even look like black populations or Afro-diasporic populations were ever there because it becomes modern. It becomes pop culture. It becomes whatever. So uh, I think it's uh, you know time and space. Yeah.
Yeah, but I think you're absolutely right. It's the question of, and, and I think this is a good place to, to work toward the spatial because I also think the challenge of an architecture schools is that it, because it's such a universal discipline, I mean, it comes out of the enlightenment moment as a discipline, architect, architecture, not building, um, is that the question of subjectivity gets lost. Um, the modern subject is complete. The architect is always transparent, staring above his world, looking downward. Um, and so, you know, the question of time is also where being gets cast, right? Um, within modernity. Um, and so this notion of becoming, I think, becomes a challenge because it talks about this constant recasting of being um, in the making, in a way. And I'm wondering um, if, if in Poe and Paul you could sort of address that, because I think you both sort of talk about that with Abdul Malik Simone's work, um, mm. most certainly. Uh, uh, <coughs> before I do that, I'd like to just quickly address the question of temporality, which I think is essential, because, um, and it goes beyond kind of theory or Afrocentrism, or sorry, Afrofuturism, or these kinds of ideas that are kind of circulating in the academy or in art circles, but actually goes back to um, my own personal memory of growing up in London, the son of uh, Caribbean migrants. And this notion, I've got a friend here from London as well, which we grew up with, which is black people time. How many of you have this in the States? We call it BPT, right? Yeah. Like you call time. it CPT. CPT. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trust me, the Koreans have us beat. Right, so it's kind of sense, it's this kind of sense that, you know, you're always late. And sometimes you think, I need to deploy it, I need to, I need to turn that strategy around. I mean, I don't have people time. You know, I'm going to be late, hey, so. But it's just thinking about that, I mean, that was something that we grew up with, you know? And it's, it is a kind of discrepant uh, temporality, which is becoming coded in the black vernacular culture. And which, for example, thinking about the aesthetics of uh, hip hop, or even blues, the way that you know, the beat is um, continually changed, um, sometimes slowed down, um, sometimes extended, you know, the, the, the blues note, sometimes extended and, you know, and dragged out, I think is also kind of reflecting that, um, that gap that gap from um, chrononormativity, that gap from where you're supposed to be, that kind of inbuilt anachronism, which I think many of our communities have turned into style, culture, um, a way of expressing ourselves that, that tries to resist this kind of norm, the temporal and spatial norms that we are supposed to, uh, to, to operate under. So what I guess my point is, is that this is very much embedded in black Local culture, and, and, and what and I understand it's, it's around the world. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of around the world. And in terms of um, spatialities, um, yeah, I mean, this is something that um, myself, as I mentioned before, you know, before I came to contemporary art, I was trained within kind of um, geography and spatial disciplines, and um, it's something, as you said, I completely echo your sentiment, um, Mabel, in terms of finding the right company to speak about these issues with. So, because um, it was something that I was very much, I felt very much alone kind of addressing these questions. When I started talking about black urbanism you know, quite a few years ago, especially in London, people were like, what are you talking about? You know, it's, it's, kind of, it's a racist notion. It's kind of a, you're talking about a black city? Why would you talk about a black city? What does that mean? Right? Especially in a place like in London where, uh, in, in England, where the closest we have to you know, an all-black city would be, you know, certain parts of London. You know, don't forget we're talking about the black population in the UK um, being something like between five and eight percent of the population, right? Uh, maybe a bit more. London is now 24 percent um, foreign-born. That includes foreigners of all different descriptions as well as, right? So, um, so this idea of a black city or black, or thinking about blackness in cities is something which is really kind of alien <laughs> to the British experience. And so but this is the kind of conversation I've been waiting for, to be honest with you, for a long time, you know, to have all people who know what I'm talking about, particularly colleagues in art history and architecture. Um, anyway, that's before you want to address. I, I, I'm going to speak to, I think, I think that everything that's been said in relation to black people time is also <laughs> African time. So, mm. uh, <laughs> and each, and each uh, African country has its own sort of, uh, you know, temporal lag. But um, I think that when Simone uh, could be misreading it, but when he speaks about these subjects in formation, it's around the sort of everyday struggles of trying to have some sort of coherent sense of self. 
as a human being and how in many instances, particularly in a city like Johannesburg, the, the sort of machinations of the city government and, and, the, and the state are constantly working against this, the kind of logics of uh, lower income urban residents to find coherence in their everyday lives. But I think that I wanted, I actually want to take this idea of the subject into information a little further back, which is around the right that many Africans claim to redefine their own identity at the moment of independence, which is another kind of subject information, which is a forward looking uh, and not a survivalist, it's not a survivalist figure, but it's actually a utopian figure that was capable of imagining uh, the future, that was capable of imagining freedom. Um, and I think that what's happening in a city like Johannesburg at the moment is that they haven't come to terms, or we haven't come to terms with the fact that we are an African city. So the imaginary in, in Johannesburg is, is an imaginary of New York, or an imaginary of Vancouver. So in the policy documents they say, you know, by the year 2030, Johannesburg will be a city that is on par with New York, London, Tokyo, and Vancouver. So, so that's, that's, that's the aspiration um, of what the Afrofuture city will be, and it, and it leaves all of these other figures and all of these other desires and longings behind. So I think that um, one, of the, one of the ways in which this happens is, is around the sort of discipline and um, uh, imposing discipline through a set of aesthetic norms, right? So because buildings don't conform to a particular image of modernity, um, it produces these subjects who can never really participate in the city and whose desire for the city can never be realized. And this is not just survivalist, it's also at a very sort of deep ontological existential level. So African spatial practices, African cultural practices are not embedded in a uh, sort of narrow colonial understanding of what modernity could be. And I think that one of the things that designers and architects can do is to reimagine new spatial typologies of what this future city can be. And we have to develop a set of techniques and strategies to sort of, first of all, learn how to read these spaces, these spatial practices, and develop typologies and, and, and spatial, spatial modes or design practices that allow for this kind of desire, this subject information to, to be realized and to keep being reinvented. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is a conversation, so I don't know if people want to sort of ask questions. Within yeah, that. And then we can open it. Yeah, I was going to open it out to this question. I think the point you're making is quite interesting because I'm from New Zealand and New Zealand is like a really young country. And Johannesburg was officially Johannesburg since 1886 or something. And are you are you saying like um, people are trying to find it hard to look back at a kind of tradition where there was a type of architecture before that they're trying to build upon? Rather, there's <coughs> it's kind of like a, you're blessed with having no tradition, so you can do whatever you want. <laughs> But people are so, sort of lost because we find, like I find in Auckland, they're always trying to aspire to be like New York or to be like, you know, San Francisco or something. But really, it's why don't we just try and redefine ourselves and do something completely different? And is that something that you're sort of? I think I think that there are many different approaches to how to reimagine a city. There are some people who want to return to a sort of a golden age of African history and African urban life and reintroduce it to the city or reimagine it in the city and that's its own sort of political cultural project that I don't participate in um, because it, it, uh, for me a lot of that uh, nostalgia for a golden age in, in African history doesn't engage with the difficult power questions mm -hmm. that are associated with traditional African social formations like issues of gender mm -hmm. for instance and, and property and ownership. So I think that there is some value in, in being rooted in, in a past, but I think that even our past is multiple. So you know, do you, do you draw on a radical revolutionary African past where um, uh, African men and women were rethinking gender roles and thinking about freedom and thinking about education in, in interesting ways, or is it something that's further back in time? So I think that, I think that those are sort of very sort of subliminal debates that are taking place around which, which, which interpretation and which, which particular moment in African history do, do people want to root themselves in. Whereas there are very sort of contemporary uh, challenges in the city that are not necessarily about um, indigenous spatial practices, but are very much about this moment uh, and the moment of Johannesburg as a space of migration and a mixing of people from all over the continent. <coughs> 
which raises a whole set of other questions because then you can't mm. privilege indigeneity as, as a paradigm in which to reach yourself. Well, it can't be the only um, place where you reach yourself. I think some of these um, aspirations for, of these cities to be come like London, Paris, etc., etc., New York, <coughs> are based on very outmoded imaginaries, right? So, for example, <laughs> London today is unthinkable without thinking about black urbanism or the, or the way that migrants have completely transformed London um, today. So, one of the and that's a growing consciousness, actually, that that sense of difference is a growing consciousness that I think many people in London are realizing that actually what makes London stand out is its incredible diversity, right? And is its kind of blackness in some respects, right? So, for example, when, when London won the Olympics, uh, the Olympics bid, it won that bid and it, it focused on a lot of its bid on the fact that it is an incredibly dynamic um, city of ethnic minority populations and cultural diversity. That was the main kind of selling point of London, which is why it got the, the, the it was, you can trust that to the kind of way that many people around the world think of London a few years ago. London being, you know, Big Ben, you know, kind of House of Parliament, you know, all white cities. It's like, that's a, it's a complete discrepancy. So my point is, is that many of these cities are, have been completely transformed and are being transformed by what I call black urbanism which also could be other forms of urbanism, right? So we need to kind of um, sort of rethink that because, you know, black urbanism is already, you know, always already here within these places. It is part of these cities and becoming even more so um, um, as, you know, as these cities um, develop and become more and more integrated into global. But my, I guess my question to that, though, is, that, is there a way to maintain its sort of criticality I mean, its own sort of tension and productive capacity? Because it seems like also kind of what you're describing um, is the degree to which that as a kind of image and a signifier right, of, a, of a contemporary city can be essentially marketed, yeah. right? Yeah. To attract essentially tourist dollars and investment, right, in neoliberal capitalism in terms of development and banking and foreign investors who don't even live there who are just parking surplus capital. And so is there a way in which it sort of as I think as you describe it, a more sort of on the ground, everyday spatial practices that is, is transforming the city almost from the bottom up as opposed to this overall branding image, which, you know, with Johannesburg's world-class African city branding campaign fundamentally backfired because, um, you know, people said, well, what does that mean? And really, you know, given all of the sort of problems actually on the ground, can it even make that claim? Um, and again, it was a way of attracting tourist investment and, uh, capital investment as well. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, a question. I mean, other questions from the audience? Oh. Laurie. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. I think you're all really uh, terrific. Uh, they sort of got me thinking. I'd like to maybe just kind of touch upon a couple of things said by a number of you. Um, Kelly's sort of relationship between the spiritual and the future. Um, and also thinking about these sort of time lags. And it seems to me that perhaps then, because the future is never ending, and it's not finite, that these time lags perhaps, instead of thinking of them as not normal, but they somehow supersede the normal. Um, and that in terms of, I guess, Mabel's comment about being and coming, that um, this kind of, the superseding of the, 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 the normal, the kind of syncopation is a kind of always already condition, perhaps, um, with, with regards to blackness, I suppose, or in the way that we're sort of having this discussion about CBT or BPT or whatever. Um, <laughs> but that syncopation is somehow part of that process that just kind of continues in terms of the becoming. Because the becoming also never ends. It does, but it also looks back. I mean, I think that's the interesting, it, it doesn't end because you're talking about the future, but it always is looking back in different ways and kind of uh, recycling some of these ideas. Like, that's what, I, when I, you know, <coughs> came back across that image of the pot and the river and water, and, you know, of course, we're, we're thinking, you know, 
in that context about spirituality also escape, but also maybe as mourning the middle passage, you know, mourning death, um, you know, or, or thinking about getting back there, you know, the people who put those pots in that river, you know. Um, and is that about mourning the past, or is that about a future thing of trying to get yourself back there or to another spiritual realm in which you are back there. So I think it, 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 um, it signals both directions, which is you know, what I found really fascinating about it and what I loved about finding a pot from the 18th century that could actually do that, uh, that showed us that people had been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and, uh, and that spirituality is one way of really thinking about that, but that there are other ways, like you said, of thinking about that, whether it's space, architecture, um, different forms of urbanism, survival. Um, so to me, what's interesting is the future, but also how it, it also, in looking ahead, it looks back, and that's what Afrofuturism tells us about. Um, in productive ways that you know looks at the past, but it's somehow the past becomes future, becomes new. I think I think that Lake J. Pierce's work is is an interesting example of that because um, Mabel and I were discussing um, apartheid spatiality yesterday, and and I said to her that South Africa is the future, that that South African cities are the future of cities in in what is called the global north, where you have increasing polarization, increasing fragmentation. Um, and, and its spatialization in cities. And so what was uh, the blueprint of oh, the apartheid city? Corridors and housing projects in Manhattan. Right, so yeah. what, what was yeah. the blueprint of the apartheid city in the 1950s is becoming the future of, of American cities in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of convergence between sort of colonial spatial practices and neoliberal spatial practices mm -hmm. where they actually become, it becomes increasingly difficult to tell them apart. And I think that Lake does this interesting thing where he has a past system and the city of the future, which is about neoliberal global capitalism happening in, in the same image. So I think that that's where criticality and a kind of Afrofuturism comes in, where we don't see time linearly as colonialism as something that happened a long time ago and now we're in a, in a radically different present, but actually about this mo notion of recurrence. So while we are subject to information, there are also other patterns that are, that, that are returning and that recur and, and have a different manifestation in the present and have implications <coughs> for the future. Well, I wonder whether, um, because Afrofuturism, um, it's becoming, there's a kind of new or new iteration to Afrofuturism that are being taken up by a lot of younger people. Uh, certainly in London, um, there's a big scene now um, which calls itself Afrofuturism and just looks back at, inspired obviously by people like um, Sun Ra and um, and John Contra's work, um, mm. people like that. But it's kind of becoming conflated, this is my concern. It's become, the discourse around Afrofuturism is becoming conflated with this idea around the new black, which someone like um, uh, Farrell talked about recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, uh, another, right, maybe he's missed that. But there's also another term that is also surfacing a lot. In, in, in London and other places, which is Afropolitan. And they're becoming, oh, yes. like, the idea of a new global <laughs> African citizenship co or cos cosmopolitanism. Which is, right? which is not rooted in any kind of political exactly, reality. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> but, that, but that's what's happened, what, there's a lot of conflation about that. A lot of young people who are addressing or using or thinking about Afrofuturism as a kind of very exciting <laughs> mode. But that criticality, yeah. in my opinion, is starting to be missed and starting to be kind of, I think, um, confused in some ways. And I think we need to be sort of careful about that. I mean, I saw there was a big event at PS1 MoMA recently, was it last year? That was curated by Team Brit um, around Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. It sounded very exciting. I saw some tweets around it, and people were saying, you know, kind of Afrofuturist, Afropolitan, da 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 And there's all these kinds of things, and it really reminded me of the fact that, you know, well, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. We say Afrofuturism, I don't think it's just one Afro, you know what I mean? So it's kind of, um, we have to, the way in which these discourses are being, as you say, caught up within a kind of neoliberal market gloss, which kind of 
doesn't really address the critical questions around class, for example, mm -hmm. you know, um, and how that impinges on these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm to say one more question. Yeah. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you all. My mind is in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Professor Jones, thank you, because I, I think a lot about black vernacular. And I was trying to figure out how I fit in Afrofuturism with my ideas, and you helped me frame that. Um, I wanted to find out from you, when I was in London hanging out, black people were also South Asian immigrants, or South Asian people. Is that still the norm? And are you including, are they included in your vision of what you're saying, blackness and yeah. the modes of blackness? And then the other question I wanted to ask to all of you all, um, well, I, I was thinking about this whole future city or black city or Harlem world, like the kind of like, is would, would black nationalism have been an Afro-futuristic kind of mode? And also, um, what about the nomadic groups of Africa? And this whole idea of like us relocating to shanty towns and all that, how does that apply to quote unquote ancient traditions in Africa? It's all convoluted. I don't know, y'all yeah. pick and choose. And <laughs> <laughs> some, great, some great questions there. Uh, in terms of the black British, um, kind of understanding of blackness, um, the answer really is yes and no, in the sense that there are still kind of, okay, so the idea that uh, in the sort of 70s and 80s, there was a very political moment where um, blackness embraced, particularly in the art world, but, in, in, but also in, in you know, struggles, community struggles, where blackness came to be fine, a radical um, position against dominant white notions of race, and that encompassed both black and Asian communities, and Asian being South Asian as well as East Asian, mm -hmm. right? And so anyone who wasn't black could identify with being, uh, so who was white, could identify with being black. There was a very, it was a political idea of blackness, um, rather than a racial or ethnic idea. Now that has kind of became dissipated as various um, governments and local authorities started to kind of introduce you know, multicultural ideas and funding which targeted different groups. So people start to say, well actually, if you, if you know, if I kind of um, address, my, address the state under the notion of Asian or Muslim, I'm gonna get more money. And so there's that way which they're gonna divide and more kind of thing. Now there are still within the academy and within certain intellectual circles, there are still black people and Asian people still kind of hold on to this notion of blackness as being a political thing. But I would say that for a lot of younger people, that, that has gone at that moment, right? So other identities have kind of come up, Muslim, um, you know, Asian, um, other forms of, of, of identification. There's even a, there's a group in London called Cutie Pop, which is queer, transgendered um, people of color. So the, 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 P, the POC, people of color designation, which I understood was an American kind of concept, some people have started to bring that into to the UK. So in other words, what I'm saying is it's quite a confused landscape really. Um, and the way that I use it in my work kind of shifts as well. I still hold on to a notion of blackness. So for example, I'm going to be organising in my, my role at, in London um, as chair of Black Art and Time, I'm including Asian artists within that, or Asian artists that identify with blackness, not all do. Um, but in other contexts, we're talking about black urbanism, you know, depending on where it is, you know, you have to that that definition will you know will be will change. So. I, I mean I think that for me the uh, liberation movements in, in in different African countries, some of them were black nationalists and some of them were were simply anti imperialist and anti fascist. So if you look at the discourse of Van Gogh of uh, Mozambique for instance, um, there was there was a massive sort of drive out of the sort of settler Portuguese population, but it wasn't it, it wasn't a race war. It was a war against fascism and colonialism. And so anybody who remained and identified with the socialist project um, of the liberation movement was allowed to stay. And there was a discourse of Mozambiqueness, but that was still an African liberation movement, right? And an, and an African liberation movement. And in South Africa, the ANC claims to be a non-racial organization, but it still has a very strong African nationalist um, thrust. So I think that um, that there's also a tension around black nationalism and African liberation movements, and that they're not necessarily the same thing. But I think what the two 
have in common is, is a, a moment or a set of moments where people made a very sort of collective movement towards freedom and it was defined mm -hmm. in different ways. And this freedom was in relation to imperialism mm -hmm. in, its, in its many forms, whether it's capitalism, or white supremacy or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think that that is what frames the kind of um, thrust towards the future as opposed to a very sort of inward looking um, strategy. It's something that's actually about a projection of an alternative radical future. That's very different from, from the status quo. Yeah, like on, on that note, there was a really great film shown at the, this documentary shown at the Miller Theater yesterday. I don't know if people had a chance to see it, but it was called Soft Vengeance. And so it was a biography of Albie Sachs, who was the author of the Constitution for South Africa, but also an anti-apartheid activist who ended up in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And part of what the story tells is exactly why he ends up in Mozambique and what that made him who was there. And, and, and how that um, you know how that how that became a place where many 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 South Africans were, were moving precisely because it was welcoming um, to you know sort of various people who were positioned within the anti-apartheid movement um, and um, so anyway I think it's a very interesting film sort of related to that that history but the other thing that he said you know when he came on stage and talked was he said that fundamentally the amount you you he, he, he believes that culture is vital to revolutionary projects so, projects for political change precisely because you have to imagine something different than where you are. And he said, without the imagination, you're nowhere. Um, and he said, that's fundamental. If you don't nurture that, nothing's ever going to change. Um, and he said, people always said, you know, it's impossible. So it's been 300 years, South Africa would never change. And he kept saying, no, we have to imagine what that will be, and then we can make that happen. And so the imagination becomes kind of critical for people beginning to understand and galvanize what that is. And imagination becomes a political act as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it was just absolutely fantastic that he said that. But also keep in mind that the imagination is also a site of desire and pleasure and um, many other things that often aren't the things that one you know, um, experiences you know, in some sort of survival mode or on the ground sort of challenging all of these, I think, these frameworks. So. Yes, um, last it's question. Well, from well, it's not just my it's more <laughs> common. And, uh, I think what is really interesting came up of what Mpo ended saying that the African city is the, is the global city, right? I mean, I, I don't know exactly how he said it, but he said the African city is the, is the future of the city. Is the, um, I mean, to me, what is interesting uh, hearing you is that I see a lot, and, and also seeing some of the fantastic images, and one of the, uh, the guy from the poster, Leighton, is his name? And, uh, and I saw the movie of John when I was in uh, Johannesburg in March, so I actually was um, amazed by the projection uh, of the, this kind of like incredible landscape. Um, there's something that I read in the, in the African city uh, that for me is very much of New York, is very much of any city, is very much of any metropolitan city, is very much of the idea of a large urbanity, a large metropolitan area, and how um, and, and how it, it has changed. And our cities have changed just by the fact that we live in a much more rural culture and that it's incredibly more dynamic, and so on and so forth. And uh, and so in a way, I'm really curious about how much the idea of the Afro urbanism um, is there. Is I mean, it's a little bit what you were saying. It's everywhere. It's not, it's not just confined to uh, a, an African reality or, uh, or to a, an African colonized reality. I mean, it's so much bigger than that, you know, it's something that overlays with. So for me, it's also interesting to look at it from the other side, because the idea that Johannesburg is projected to be developed, to become like New York or Tokyo or, uh, Vancouver itself, right? <laughs> it's a way of looking at New York, Tokyo, and Vancouver as the image that comes out of New York, Tokyo, and Vancouver, which is not what New York, Tokyo, and Vancouver are about, because there is so much more of Johannesburg inside New York, Tokyo, and Vancouver, but that's not the image that we project out. So it, to me, it's a very interesting way in which these two things also talking about criticality are uh, completely omnipresent, but maybe what comes to the foreground 
not what one wants to see, and what one is actually seeing maybe appears more through the work of an artist, a filmmaker, uh, you know, through the utopias that we project, but they're actually completely part of the reality that we experience daily, living especially in urban, large urban metropolitan areas where these layers are built in just in the kind of dynamism and layers and complexity that has all of that as part of the place. But I think if one brings brings this sort of convergence or this overlap into sharp focus, it will begin to raise very different set of questions about New York, right? So, so can you ask third world questions about a city like Manhattan? Can you ask, you ask third world questions, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and it would be great to bring some Johannesburg students to come here and totally. map it. And, and that's what I meant by new urban yeah. anthropology. Uh, yeah. What can we learn from yeah. these places? Yeah. From yeah. So I, I think that that's where that's that's where the specificity of the Afro city, Afro Afro future city, or Afro city uh, lies, and that there are a set of questions that tend to be very focused in cities in Africa or the global south that are not asked of cities like New York or San Francisco or whatever. Right. But, or they, but, but you also but it's they don't want to ask them. They don't want to see them. Right. right. It's yeah. the kind of stuff that you generally. That's why it's interesting, like the critical views, the stuff that you want to put away, scoop, up, scoop aside, and not look at. And know. even when it's here, it's something that doesn't quite belong here, it belongs somewhere else. So there are all of these kind of weird temporalities um, that exist in the city, like this belongs in another time, right? right. Actually, it's of this time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think the question of epistemology is exactly right, and it's the project of Studio X is like, mm -hmm. the fact that we don't know, and what knowing of those places will do would be exactly bring them back to a place mm -hmm. like New York. So on that note, <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for coming. Um, and I think this has been an extraordinary conversation. So thank you. Thank you.